Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to this week's Access Chat. Um, today we um, are going to feature Kathy Dalton and we're really looking forward to hearing her very unique points of view and I think that um, we invited her because we think uh, she has a lot to say and that the world needs to listen to her. So we're very excited to have her here. And Antonio Santos is joining me again. And uh, but Neil is on vacation. I, I don't know why he thinks he gets vacation, but he's on holiday today. So Antonio. Uh, th thank you, Deborah. Uh, uh, we, we are. This is one of the the, the few access chats in uh, actually had the opportunity of uh, meeting someone before uh, the chat. So I, I had the chance to meet. Uh, Katie, uh, a few weeks ago in Cork, you know, we're basically uh, living in the same area uh, in Ireland. So, and then after that talk, oh, I, we need to find way, a way uh, to bring uh, Katie to access chat because you know we have been talking with, with uh, over a few s s type of topics over the last you know six months, and I think. Now we have a, a, something that is completely different from what what we've been discussing so far. So, uh, before we start, I'm going to ask, I'm going to welcome Katie to Access Chat, and I'm going to ask her to introduce herself a little bit. Okay, my name is Kathy Dolden. I'm an architect, and now I'm an academic as well. Um, I practiced for quite a long time. A lot of my work was in the area of accessibility, um, universal design, and eventually healthcare design. And then I went back and did a PhD in architecture, but it was about using wireless sensor networks in built environment. So I proposed a new model for responsive architecture, which is user-centered and doesn't just respond to functional needs, but also responds to how a person is feeling. Um, I'm very interested in the idea of introducing architect or interaction design to built environment. Um, and I think that architecture and some of the traditional disciplines have a lot to learn from how interaction design is treated in ICT where user experience is becoming increasingly important. And I think that affective computing, which measures mood and emotion, is a very good way of measuring user experience. Well, Kathy, welcome to Access Chat. We're really glad that you're here. Um, we, we try to, um, we're trying to take access disability and disability inclusion um, to a whole nother level with Access Chat. And that's one reason why Antonio insisted, you know, that we bring you on. And when we looked at what you had done, we were also very impressed. But traditionally, we're seeing accessibility done, you know, sort of a lot of times, you know, after the fact and one at a time and separate, you know, we'll just test the website portion and what do you think about, you know, how should we be doing it differently based on your, you know, what your background, your academic background? I mean, how, what are some suggestions we could do to make this part of everything that we're doing in society? Well, my involvement in accessible design goes back 20 years when it was relatively unusual and why I would have moved forward very quickly is that I refused point blank to consider it as being an add-on, that I think accessibility in built environment or in web design or in interaction design is part of a good design and that we're rapidly running out of excuses as to why it shouldn't be. Um, the idea of inclusive design is a very interesting one. It's coined by Roger Coleman in the Royal College of Art um, at the Helen Hamlin Centre. And the idea is that if you do include people in your design, whether it's for a product or an interface or an environment, it makes it much easier to use for everybody. So that instead of designing special things one at a time, that if you really try hard to actually include people and that you can learn a huge, huge amount about designing for people with disabilities or with different cognitive ability, because quite often you find that if you develop a really good solution, or what you think is a marginal group, suddenly you go, hey, everybody's going to want one of these. And that's what inclusive design is about. Um, and what you need also is joined up thinking, which you really can't avoid as an architect. Um, and that you need to import that into other domains. So that's where user experience comes in again. It's from the minute you switch the device on to the minute you turn it off again, from, you know, right through every aspect of the encounter. And in that regard, design is extremely important. Um, you know, creative input and how designers think about things. 
which is, tends to be in a joined up way. Katie, I have, a, I have another question. Um, when you use the term um, architect, are you using, how are you using that? Are you using it just for the built environment or are you using it in, um, as you had said a little bit before, you using it with ICT and, you know, in the broader term? Um, when I'm speaking about it, it's usually in terms of built environment, but it's actually kind of a use because if designers to get properly involved in delivering solutions in ICT, then systems architecture is actually one area where they might actually be quite useful because we tend to think, to think of things from top level down, that you think of the whole solution rather than start at the very, you know, start at the very bottom end of it, which might be coding for something, that you tend to think of things in a slightly different way. And I'm going to ask you one more question, then I'm going to stop and I'm going to let Antonio ask some questions. But what I've seen in my career is that any time that we've designed things in the way you're suggesting, it really does improve the design for everyone. Uh, I, saw, I wrote an article not long ago about um, assistive technology that had been, and not just assistive technology, but the things that have been accessible, that have been made accessibly, like assistive technology or a design or things that had been created for people with disabilities, but because they really considered all aspects of it, including universal design, it wound up being things that were very beneficial to um, all of us. And the examples I used in my article was captioning. We know we created captioning for people that were deaf, but everybody's using captioning now. They're using them in airports and sports bars, and and a text to speech is an example. Our, uh, you know, our cars are talking to us, our phones are talking to us, we're talking back to them, and a lot of those really cool technologies were created for people with disabilities. So I, I was hoping you might want to uh, take that topic and run with it a little bit too, and then we'll turn it over to Antonio for some of his questions. Yeah, it's quite an interesting because as a designer, I like pictures, and we tend to think in pictures, not in words. And, you know, if you were designing an SS that interface for somebody who couldn't read, for example, where you actually tend to use things like and that would appeal to a heck of a lot of other people as well. Um, and that, that's quite an interesting one because the next area of research I'm hoping to move into is assistive technologies for children with autism spectrum disorders. And people on the autism, autism spectrum prefer, um, they tend to process in, um, information visually, which is something they have in common with a lot of designers. So there are people of different preferred modes of using things or of learning things and some people go more in one direction than another so the more of those modalities if you like that you can address and the better it gets. Um, one quite interesting thing in my own research proposal about using affect to decide whether something is usable or not um, is that that idea was conceived for people who are having co cognitive impairment from dementia because they might not be able to communicate and manage their environment. And if you think about that, having an environment that responds to how you're dealing with it, then you're kind of going, well, there are lots of places you could use that. So that every time you focus on a particular issue, you learn something general from that. Well said. Mm, now I've got Antonio in sound. What, what type of experts uh, do you have working with you in, in, in the area of dementia? Are you in touch with, with doctors? Or who is helping you on that side? Well, when I was doing my PhD, PhD is usually quite a lone endeavor, but I would have been speaking to doctors, um, to other designers, to people involved in ICT. And that's the other really important thing about um, if you want to do embedded computing in built environment or in devices, it's interdisciplinary. You can't do it on your own. You can't do it on your own if you're a coder. You can't do it on your own if you're a designer. There are very few people who will ever be able to pick up the whole skill set. And that whole idea of interdisciplinarity is really important. So that if I go on to the next stage, um, I'll be working with people who can code. I'll be working with people who can do image manipulation. And I learn some of their skills, but I learn enough to manage, if you like, what other people are doing, because it's one of those things you can't do it on your own. And that's very well recognized in affective computing already. It's, it's recognized as being cross-disciplinary because it involves engineering and design and psychology. Um, 
behavior signs, the whole lot. Uh, uh, what type of reception are you getting from them when you are explaining them your project? I think people have been very enthusiastic about it because it's cross-disciplinary. And also, I think there's been a lot of interest in the idea that you might use affective computing, um, particularly in healthcare situations or in therapeutic situations, um, as an aid to interpreting what's happening, for the person to interpret their environment and, and for the environment to compensate by interpreting the person. Because this, this idea of how you cope is dependent on your skills. And if your skills are decreased, then trying to cope with your environment, including your built environment, can become a source of stress. So now that we can, you can actually start making environments that actually start to meet the person in terms of ability. And that's um, a really interesting idea. Um, but I suppose what differentiates my proposal is that whole idea that it doesn't just address things switching off and switching on, but they're switching on and off in response to user patterns and user behavior and user reaction. So we are talking about uh, about uh, uh, creating environments that they end up learning with the people yeah. who are going to use those environments. Yeah, yeah, and that's really important. Um, it it will involve very complex systems because you will actually. If it, and the other thing is, if it's truly intelligent as a system or as an environment, you really can't argue that it, that it should actually include affective computing, because even for human beings, logic is not what makes good decisions. Logic and emotion are completely intertwined, and emotion is actually what allows you to make value judgments. And the same applies to computational systems. That if you actually endow them with the ability to apply value judgments, that's when they start to learn. This worked better than that did. She didn't like that. She did like that. Oh, look, that worked. Now, it'll take a while, but from the pace of change I've seen over the last few years, um, a lot of the technologies that we would need are just about there, and they all need to be stitched together into a coherent whole. Uh, I read recently um, uh, uh, an interview from someone on Facebook that is working with, with machine learning, and they were talking about uh, the, challenge, the, the challenges that they have. Uh, we know that they have access to a, a, a massive amount of data in order mm -hmm. to work and to develop their own projects. How much data do you think you need in order to, to be able to, to go to the next step of your project? Well, at the the process is breaking it down. So what I'm going to try and do is to make one affective feedback loop. And that will be between the person. I'll be using visual imagery to see how that works on the person. And then actually recording their reactions and then feeding that, I hope, back into the system. But that's probably going to take me two or three years to get it working at all. But in a way, if I get that working, that's proof that it works and it can be used as a template for other feedback loops. And then, of course, up a level, you're going to have to have a platform that they can all connect to and above that. I, I'm interested as well in the idea of what I think is going to make it work is distributed intelligence. Rather, not a single computer, but that the whole parts can interconnect. And that's when it gets way out of my ballpark and into somebody else's. But I think it's doable because I've seen what's happened. I've been watching a lot of the technologies, particularly the sensing technologies, and the whole idea of event marking, that you don't want all the data, you want it when it's important. You know, when there's a change, when it means something. So that's what you actually do, sort of analytics that give meaning to big data, if you like. Well, it, it seems to me, also, that <clears throat> isn't this sort of what we're trying to accomplish with smart homes and smart cities, yeah. a lot of the efforts that are being made with those things? Those are very, very promising. Yeah, except that, and I've had somebody else draw my attention to it as well, who's another academic whose core discipline is architecture, but who's now involved in governance, who had just been to a Smart Cities conference and said, but what about the users? Nobody mentioned the users. That, you know, there's talk about managing traffic flow and sustainability and this and that, but there was very little about the inter interface of the smart system of the city with the individual user. No, I, I was looking, there, there, was, a, there, there was a conference uh, happening uh, during this weekend uh, um, in London and there has been quite a few number of events on the week before about user design, designing for government. And uh, I, I was paying attention to the streams and to the conversations. And once more, and, uh, there was so much focus on the design and, and the art side of things. 
and everybody was ignoring designing for accessibility and basically ignoring the users. So everybody was talking about designing for government, designing for public services. So, but mm -hmm. But everybody was missing that part from the conversation. Why do you think this is still happening today? We are talking about people who are on their 25, 26, and they are the ones who are missing this. Maybe it's because when you're 25 or 26, you think you're immortal. <laughs> it could be a little bit of that. That you know everything is easy. Um, you've got lots of energy. Things aren't difficult to use, and so on and so forth. That people gain perspective on that as they get older. Um, one kind of big education thing for me was having children. You know, re from practical things to hauling children around in buggies in and out of things to how it encroaches on your time. You know, that you live two different lives and that you can actually be very much constrained by it. So maybe getting more women to discussion would be a useful thing because they do have different perspectives. Because most of us, I think, which is majority of women still do have children at some point, um, can't afford just to think from the perspective of one person. So you always have to consider people who are quite often not able. And women, quite the majority of carers are female as well. So I think maybe introducing women's perspectives would actually be a very useful thing. Um, it's possibly something that's in our nature, and I'll probably get into trouble for saying that. But um, it's complementary as well. The skills are complementary. <clears throat> I, I I would say, you know I agree with what you're saying, but I would say that I do have to make a shout out for a lot of the young people because a lot of the people, the young people that I see working in the field of social good and really wanting to make sure that people have you know human rights and are included, I'm I'm meeting some incredible young people that do seem to get it, and I don't know maybe they don't get the need for inclusion and reducing the digital divide and all that maybe maybe they haven't experienced all of it but a lot of the young people that I'm meeting, for example, and uh, Andrea and Rolando that we did with Draw Disability Antonio, I'm seeing such social consciousness coming from the younger generation now. And I know you, I can't say that about every single young person in the world, but I'm very, very hopeful from what I'm seeing with a lot of these young people. And, and I, it almost is like, I hate to, you know, make fun of my generation, but it seems like a lot, I've seen a lot of people that are my age and my generations, they're the ones that are leaving out the users. And so, I mean, we're trying to learn and grow and evolve as well, but I'm very hopeful for the young generation. They seem to get that if we're not all included, if we, if we don't stop disenfranchising people that, that, that we can't really make major societal change for the good. So I, I just, um, I know that it's easier. I've been a, a programmer for, a technologist for so many years, and a programmer for years, and I don't do programming anymore, and I personally really hate programming, but um, but I, I find that there seems to be something happening, even with you doing your PhD. You know, it's like you're seeing something happening too, so, um, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a hopeful person, but I'm hopeful something important is happening where we do better when we all participate. Yeah. And we, like you said, Katie, when we have good design, then it benefits all of us. So I just wanted to make a shout out for some of the young people I'm, I'm seeing, especially working with some of the UN efforts. Yeah, um, I think one interesting thing is that the, I suppose, broadcast media in this country and are perennially critical of social media. But I think it's also a huge force for good because it joins people together. It stops you being able to pretend to be unaware of what's going on with other people. So, I mean, this chat is an example, but you see it all over the place. Um, and I think it can be a tremendous force for good. But you can't afford anymore to say, well, I didn't know because it's probably, you have difficulty <laughs> proving that anymore. And I think that, that knowledge thing is hugely powerful. But I also think um, ICT is a huge potential for collaborative working. Um, you know, that ideas get put together in a way they simply, you could, we couldn't have done this 10 years ago. Well, I certainly wouldn't have had a fast enough internet connection. 
No, the 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 broad disability project that we had a, a few weeks ago, uh, the way how the project was born was actually from you know someone from the Philippines, someone from Italy, they they end up working in a project uh, together, and then they they were able to keep that connection after the project that they were in, so and they easily connect from the Philippines to Italy, and they created the the, the draw disability project that reveals some uh, to be a very interesting project where uh, Deborah's daughter is part of it. So people can easily connect uh, independently from uh, from from, wh from where they are, and because they are so passionate about what they are doing they, they you know in the same way that we go for a coffee with our friends yeah. they will just uh, open skype and have a a, a, ch a chat you know it's it's nine in the morning in one in one side of the world it's you know midnight on the other so i think you know uh, the, the way how we use technology and how technology is helping us today it is making a, a huge change in, in the way how we communicate and the way in the way in the, in the way how we learn together with each other. Yeah, and I think that it is the same potential when it spreads out into the physical environment. It, you've seen what's happened with the web over the last ten years. It's nothing short of astonishing, and that when you actually start to think that your physical environment could take on some of those characteristics, um, the potential is is just endless. And because even even on the web, I've got in touch. You were saying like about networking with other researchers, with literally dozens of people um, that I've talked to in the United States and in India and in Australia and you know, like, like all over the world, and um, where I've emailed or we've tweeted or we've occasionally skyped, and we're all singing off the same hymn sheet. And I think that ICT will be the enabler of the sort of very sophisticated systems I'm talking about. And now that we know we can, because of what we are. Because because we'll at least try, and if we try, we'll get it right eventually, which is what we're going about as well. The idea that if it doesn't, it's a little bit different to conventional research where you try it and it doesn't work. Design, you keep doing it on, and you keep making it work as well as it can. It's a bit like systems optimization in ICT. And you work with what you have, and you make the best of it. And when you get better stuff, you make better stuff, and so on and so forth. And another point which you are making, but I just want to make sure that anyone watching understands this is when we talk about the built environment, we are also talking about ICT because yeah. there is computers all through the built environment. It's it's just amazing what's happening. We have kiosks. We have, you know, the, it, there's so many really cool uh, technologies and assistive technologies and, you know, doorbells that, you know, flash and announce. And it's just, uh, I love technology myself, but of taking all of that stuff, combining it all into the built environment, it just makes it more accessible for everyone. It's, you know, it's really exciting. So I, I think, we, and you are saying this, but you can't have one conversation without the other because they're the same now. Yeah. The one really interesting thing, the other place you'll find computers in built environment is in things like system or facade management systems, where you have very complex facades that respond to daylight and sunlight and wind direction, and in building management systems. But at the moment, they're all context driven. So if you could even import the same level of complexity to the sort of computing you could use when dealing with a personal environment, that would be very interesting. Because at the moment, it's generally based on dealing with data from context and adjusting environmental conditions to that, not dealing on data from really dealing with data from the user. So the bit I'm most interested in is what happens in your personal space, if you like, and how you make that your own. I think in, in terms of the, the individuals, there's a lot of uh, things to be explored, uh, when it, especially in, in the way how the role of wearables in assistive technology. We see quite a, a you know, uh, it's you know, a huge buzz about, you know, fitness you know, and, and uh, all that, but there's a huge potential to, to use a wearable tech, uh, wearable technology uh, into into, into assistive and have it into assistive technology. There's not many people working on it, but I think there's the possibilities and the, the utility is you know is 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 far uh, from being explored. And when somebody 
decides finally to bring this to this world, I will think it will be uh, disruptive, even in, in the way our doctors uh, uh, work with their patients. I'm not sure if I've been called disruptive. Um, yeah, it's really interesting because one thing I'm hoping that even if it's a halfway house to a responsive environment, that in between you probably do use wearables so that the person can interact with their environment. And that's what I'm hoping to be doing next up, um, working with other people as well. Um, because one thing that surprised me, and it really has changed in the last three years or so, wearables three years ago weren't really wearable there weren't anything you would voluntarily wear, no matter who you were, let alone if you were, you know, somebody living in a care home. It was about the last thing you'd let near you. And they're changing so rapidly. Um, it's really interesting. And um, the information that you can get from them is pretty cool as well. Uh, there's, there, there are a few challenges with the wearables that we have today is about accuracy. So... Uh, and is also sometimes a sort of a fashion. You end up buying something, you use it for 15 days, and then you are not able to use it anymore. Or no, you are tired. Okay, this was fun, but now I don't have patience. I'm not going to use this any longer. <laughs> uh, have, have you done any sort of studies in that in in that area? Um, no, but I would have been skeptical to start off with because, from my point of view, almost the last thing I would countenance wearing would be a smartwatch. I would consider that extremely um, intrusive, to put it mildly. Whereas the idea that something that changes quite subtly in my environment to give me a cue is quite different. Um, I would actually, for me, wearing a smartwatch would be a source of stress. And I'm very interested in the idea of either minimizing stress or optimizing the relationship between the person and their environment. Um, so I would prefer to use data in a predictive way um, for predicting whether the people prefer to do certain things certain times of day. There's also really interesting ideas about using behavioral analysis from sensing for things like environmental cueing. So that if you've got somebody whose circadian rhythms are disrupted, that they get cueing in the form of lights turning down or coming up at certain times of day or night to actually reinforce their daily patterns. Now, that's a much more interesting and a much more integral use of personal data than the idea of a watch that tells you what your heartbeat is when you're out training. Again, which is much more relevant to somebody who's much younger. You know, it, it, some of those things are relevant for a particular niche market. And I think when you get past the idea of selling technology to people who are interested in technology, which Apple have done very well so far, by the way, because of usability. So you're back to usability again. So when you actually begin to make usable, inter usable environmental interactions, that's when it gets interesting. Um, you know, and when you start to use predictive modeling to tell you what all those heartbeats are actually saying over the longer term. We're not all athletes, and maybe we don't need so much of this information. And if you're an older person and living at home, it's actually much more appropriate that your environment automatically picks up some of that data and tells you about it only when you need to know if you're fine, that's fine. If it, you, you could use things like, for example, this predictive falls modeling. So if you can get a situation where your home environment tells either you or your carer or your son or daughter that the way you're walking is indicative of a problem, that's useful. And somebody in the Netherlands has actually produced that program now, but I'd like to see it embedded physically into smart homes. And that's when they actually really do get smart because then they serve a need of the user. That they, they, you, need, you need to think... In a very, at a very deep level about how it's actually going to serve the user. Okay. And uh, it is, of course, and that person's getting older. Yes. Give you all the demographics, if you like. <laughs> yes, and, and, and we know where we are in Europe, because we yep. know that Europe is, uh, is getting older, and we are all, we are all going to face that problem in, in, in probably 15 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's again, um, back to Roger Coleman, that he was the going through inclusion design, is designing for our future selves. And um, so that's a really, really interesting idea. You know, time flies, one thing, next time you're 26, and not that long, you're probably a grandmother. Not a grandmother, but um, it's much faster than you think. And life changes all the time. And your needs change all the time. And the idea of actually building environments which actually are quite fluid and where they change to match your needs is very interesting. And I think it's entirely possible. But in about 10 years' time, 15 years' time. 
Okay, uh, thank you so much, Katie. You are reaching the end of uh, of our uh, interview today. I think we have quite a, we advanced uh, quite a bit in terms of uh, uh, what we will plan to dis to discuss tomorrow on, on the Twitter chat. <laughs> uh, uh, I hope uh, I hope you you all enjoy it. Uh, the fact that we're able to be here together and uh, doing this uh, short interview. So if you are listening to this, please join us tomorrow at 8 p.m. GMT. Kate is going to be with us. We are going to launch uh, a few questions uh, uh, related with the topic that we were talking uh, here today. And we expect your answers, your retweets. We expect you just to join us under the uh, hashtag access chat. Thank you so much and see you next week.